The Last Letter by Fritz Leiber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Last Letter. On tenth month one, 2457 A.D., at exactly 9 a.m. Planetary Federation time, but with a permissible error of a millionth of a second either way, in the fifth sublevel of New New York Robot Postal Station 68, Black Sorter gulped down 10,000 pieces of first-class mail. This breakfast tidbit did not agree with the mail sorting machine. It was as if a robust dog had been fed a large chunk of good red meat with a strychnine pill in it. Black Sorter's innards went rrrr, clunk. A blue electric glow enveloped him, and he began to shake as if he might break loose from the concrete. He desperately spat back over his shoulder a single envelope with a great hoof and blew out toward the sorting tubes a medium-sized snowstorm consisting of the other 9,999 pieces of first-class mail chewed to confetti. Then he convulsed. He snapped up a fresh 10,000 and proceeded to chomp and grind on them. Black Sorter was rugged. The rejected envelope was tongued up by Red Subsorter, who growled deep in his throat, said a very bad word, and passed it to Yellow Rerouter, who passed it to Green Rerouter, who passed it to Brown Study, who passed it to Pink Wastebasket. Unlike Black Sorter, Pink Wastebasket was very delicate, though highly intuitive. The machine equivalent of a white Russian countess. She was designed to scan in 3,137 codes, route special delivery space mail to interplanetary liners by messenger rocket, and distinguish nines from upside-down sixes. Pink Wastebasket haughtily inhaled the offending envelope and almost instantly turned a bright crimson and began to tremble. After a few minutes, small atomic flames started to flicker from her midsection. White Nursemaid Seven and Greasy Joe both received Pink Wastebasket's distress signal and got there as fast as their wheels could roll them. But the high-born machine's melody was beyond their simple skills of oil can and electroshock. They summoned other machine-tending and repairing machines, ones far more expert than themselves, but all were baffled. It was clear that Pink Wastebasket, who continued to tremble and flicker uncontrollably, was suffering from the equivalent of a major psychosis with severe psychosomatic symptoms. She spat a stream of filthy ions at Gray Psychiatrist, not recognizing her old friend. Meanwhile, the paper blizzard from Black Sorter was piling up in great drifts between the dark pillars of the sublevel, and flurries had reached Pink Wastebasket's aristocratic area. An expedition of sturdy machines, headed by two hastily summoned snowplows, was dispatched to immobilize Black Sorter at all costs. Pink Wastebasket, quivering like a demented hula dancer, was clearly approaching a crisis. Finally, Gray Psychiatrist, after consulting with Green Surgeon and even then with an irritated reluctance as if he were calling in a witch doctor, summoned a human being. The human being walked respectfully around Pink Wastebasket several times, and then gave her a nervous little poke with a rubber-handled probe. Pink Wastebasket gently regurgitated her last snack, turned dead white, gave a last flicker and shake, and expired. Black Coroner recorded the immediate cause of death as tinkering by a human being. The human being, a bald and scrawny one named Pot Shelter, picked up the envelope responsible for all the trouble, stared at it incredulously, opened it with trembling fingers, scanned the contents briefly, gave a great shriek, and ran off at top speed, forgetting to hop on his perambulator, which followed him making anxious clucking noises. 
The nearest human representative of the Solar Bureau of Investigation, a rather wooden-looking man named Crumbine, also bald, recognized Pot Shelter as soon as the latter burst gasping into his office, squeezing through the door while it was still dilating. The human beings, whose work took them among the top brass, as the upper echelon machines were sometimes referred to, formed a kind of human elite, just one big nervous family. "'Sit down, Pot Shelter,' the SBI man said. "'Hold still a second so the chair can grab you. Hitch onto the hookah and choose a tranquilizer from the tray at your elbow. Whatever deviation you've uncovered can't be that much of a danger to the planets. I imagine that when you leave this office, the solar battle fleet will still be orbiting peacefully around Luna. I seriously doubt that. Potshelter gulped a large lavender pill and took a deep breath. <sighs> Crumbine, a letter turned up in the first-class mail this morning. Great Scott! It is a letter from one person to another person. Good Lord! The flow of advertising has been seriously interfered with. Oh, at a modest estimate, three hundred million pieces of expensive first-class advertising have already been chewed to rags, and I'm not sure the steel helms, God bless em, have the trouble in hand yet. Judas Priest! Naturally, the poor machines weren't able to cope with the letter. It was utterly outside their experience, beyond the furthest reach of their programming. It threw them into a terrible spasm. Pink Wastebasket is dead, and at this very instant, if we're lucky, three police machines of the toughest blued steel are holding down Black Sorter and putting a muzzle on him. Great Scott! It's incredible, Pot Shelter. And Pink Wastebasket dead? Take another tranquilizer, Pot Shelter, and hand over the tray. Crumbine received it with trembling fingers, started to pick up a big pink pill, but drew back his hand from it in sudden revulsion at its color, and swallowed two blue oval ones instead. The man was obviously fighting to control himself. He said unsteadily, I almost never take doubles, but this news you bring. Oh, good Lord, I seem to recall a case where someone tried to send a sound tape through the mails, but that was before my time. Incidentally, is there any possibility that this is a letter sent by one group of persons to another group? A hive, or a therapy group, or a social group? Uh, that would be bad enough, of course, but... No. Just one single person sending to another. Pot Shelter's expression set in grimly solicitous lines. I can see you don't quite understand, Crumbine. This is not a sound tape, but a letter written in letters. You know, letters, characters, like books. Don't mention books in this office. Crumbine drew himself up angrily and then slumped back. Excuse me, Potshelter, but I find this very difficult to face squarely. Do I understand you to say that one person has tried to use the mails to send a printed sheet of some sort to another? Worse than that, a written letter. Written? I don't recognize the word. It's a way of making characters, of forming visual equivalents of sound without using electricity. The writer, as he's called, employs a black liquid and a pointed stick called a pin. I know about this because one hobby of mine is ancient means of communication. Crumbine frowned and shook his head. Ah, communication is a dangerous business, Potshelter, especially at the personal level. With you and me, it's all right, because we know what we're doing. He picked up a third blue tranquilizer. But with most of the high folk, person-to-person -person communication is only a morbid form of advertising, a dangerous travesty of normal newscasting, catharsis without the analyst, 
recitation without the teacher, a perversion of promotion employed in betraying and subverting. The frown deepened as he put the blue pill in his mouth and chewed it. But uh, about this pin, uh, do you mean the fellow glues the pointed stick to his tongue and then speaks, and the black liquid traces the vibrations on the paper? A primitive non-electrical oscilloscope? Sloppy, but conceivable, and producing a record of sorts of the spoken word. No, no, Crumbine. Potshelter nervously popped a square orange tablet into his mouth. It's a handwritten letter. Crumbine watched him. I never mix tranquilizers, he boasted absently. Handwritten, eh? Uh, you mean that the message was imprinted on a hand, and the skin or the entire hand afterward detached and sent through the mails in the fashion of a Martian reproach? A grisly find indeed, Potshelter. You still don't quite grasp it, Crumbine. The fingers of the hand move the stick that applies the ink, producing a crude imitation of the printed word. Diabolical! Crumbine smashed his fist down on the desk so that the four phones and two score microphones rattled. I tell you, Potshelter, the SBI is ready to cope with the subtlest modern deceptions. But when fiends search out and revive tricks from the pre atomic cave era, it's almost too much. But, great Scott, I dally while the planets are in danger. What's the sender's code on this hellish letter? No code, Potshelter said darkly, proffering the envelope. The return address is handwritten. Crumbine blanched as his eyes slowly traced the uneven lines in the upper left-hand corner. From Richard Rowe, 215 West 10th Street, Horizontal, 2837 Rocket Court, Vertical, Hive 37, New New York, 319 NY, Columbia, Terra. Ugh, Crumbine said, shivering. Those crawling characters, those letters, as you call them, those things, barely enough like print to be readable. They seem to be on the verge of awakening all sorts of horrid racial memories. Oh, I find myself thinking of fur-clad witch-doctors dipping long pointed sticks in bubbling black cauldrons. No wonder Pink Wastebasket couldn't take it, brave girl. Firming himself behind his desk, he pushed a number of buttons and spoke long numbers and meaningful alphabetical syllables into several microphones. Banks of colored lights around the desk began to blink like a theater marquee sending Morse code, while phosphorescent arrows crawled purposefully across maps and space charts and through three-dimensional street diagrams. There, he said at last, the sender of the letter is being apprehended and will be brought directly here. We'll see what sort of man this Richard Rowe is, if we can assume he's human. Seven precautionary cordons have been drawn around his population station, three composed of machines, two of SBI agents, and two consisting of human and mechanical medical combat teams. Same goes for the intended recipient of the letter. Meanwhile, a destroyer squadron of the Solar Fleet has been detached to orbit over New New York. In case it becomes necessary to Z-bomb, Potshelter asked grimly, Crumbine nodded. With all those villains lurking just outside the solar system in their invisible black ships, with planet side in their hearts, we can't be too careful. One word transmitted from one spy to another, and anything may happen. And we must bomb before they do, so as to contain our losses. Better one city destroyed than a traitor on the loose who may destroy many cities. One hundred years ago, three person-to-person -person postcards went through the mails. Just three postcards, Potshelter, and fff, 
went Schenectady, Hoboken, Cicero, and Walla Walla. Here, as long as you're mixing them, try one of these oval blues. I find them best for steady swallowing. Bells jangled. Crumbine grabbed up two phones, holding one to each ear. Pot Shelter automatically picked up a third. The ringing continued. Crumbine started to wedge one of his phones under his chin, nodded sharply at Pot Shelter, and then toward a cluster of microphones at the end of the table. Pot Shelter picked up a fourth phone from behind them. The ringing stopped. The two men listened, looking doped, Crumbine with an eye fixed on the sweep second hand of the large wall clock. When it had made one revolution, he cradled his phones. Pot Shelter followed suit. I do like the simplicity of the new on the hour puffy loaf phono commercial, the latter remarked thoughtfully. The bread that's lighter than air. Nice. Crumbine nodded. I hear they've had to add mask to the lead foil wrapping to keep the loaves from floating off the shelves. Fact. He cleared his throat. Too bad we can't listen to more phono commercials. But even when there isn't a crisis on the agenda, I find I have to budget my listening time. One minute per hour strikes a reasonable balance between duty and self-indulgence. The nearest wall began to sing. Mr. J. Augustus Crumbine, we all think you're fine, 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 fine. Now out of the skyey blue come some telegraphs for you. The wall opened to a small heart shape toward the center, and a sheaf of pale yellow envelopes arced out and plopped on the middle of the desk. Crumbine started to leaf through them, scanning the little transparent windows. Hmm, electronic soap, better homes and landing platforms, psycho blinkers, your girl next door, puppy whoopsies, poopsie whoopsies. He started to open an envelope, then, after a quick look around and an apologetic smile at Pot Shelter, dumped them all on the disposal hopper, which gargled briefly. After all, there is a crisis this morning, he said in a defensive voice. Pot Shelter nodded absently. I can remember back before personalized delivery and rhyming robots, he observed. But how I'd miss them now! So much more distingue than the hives with their non-personalized radio, TV, and stereo advertising. For that matter, I believe there are some backward areas on Terra where the great advertising potential of telephones and telegrams hasn't yet been fully realized, and they are still used in part for personal communication. Now me, I've never in my life sent or received a message except by my walkie-talkie. He patted his breast pocket. Crumbine nodded, but he was a trifle shocked and inclined to revise his estimate of Potshelter's social status. Crumbine conducted his own social correspondence solely by telepathy. He shared with three other SBI officials a private telepath, a charming albino girl named Agnes. Yes, it's a very handsome walkie-talkie, he assured Pot Shelter, a little falsely. Suits you. I like the upswept antenna. He drummed on the desk and swallowed another blue tranquilizer. Damn it! What's happening to those machines? They ought to have the two spies here by now. Did you notice that the second, the intended recipient of the letter, I mean, seems to be female? Another good Terran name, too. Jane Doe. Hive in Upper Manhattan. He began to tap the envelope sharply against the desk. Damn it, where are they? Excuse me, Potshelter said hesitantly. But I'm wondering why you haven't read the message inside the envelope. Crumbine looked at him blankly. Great Scott, I assume that at least it was in some secret code, of course. Normally I'd have asked you to have Pink Wastebasket try her skill on it, but... His eyes widened, and his voice sank. You don't mean to tell me that it's... Pot Shelter nodded grimly. Handwritten, too, yes. Crumbine winced. I keep trying to forget that aspect of the case. 
He dug out the message with shaking fingers, fumbled it open, and read. Dear Jane, It must surprise you that I know your name, for our hives are widely separated. Do you recall, day before yesterday, when your guided tour of Grand Central Spaceport got stalled because the guide blew a fuse? I was the young man with hair in the tour behind yours. You were a little frightened, and a group mistress was reassuring you. The machine spoke your name. Since then I have been unable to forget you. When I go to sleep I dream of your face looking up sadly at the mistress's kindly photocells. I don't know how to get in touch with you, but my grandfather has told me stories his grandfather told him about young men writing what he calls love letters to young ladies. So I am writing you a love letter. I work at a first-class advertising house, and I will slip this love letter into an outgoing ten-thousand pack and hope. Do not be frightened of me, Jane. I am no caveman except for my hair. I am not insane. I am emotionally disturbed, but in a way that no machine has ever described to me. I want only your happiness. Sincerely, Richard Rowe. Crumbine slumped back in his chair, which braced itself manfully against him, and looked long and thoughtfully at Pot Shelter. Well, if that's a code, it's certainly a fiendishly subtle one. You'd think he was talking to his girl next door. Pot Shelter nodded wonderingly. I only read as far as where they were planning to blow up Grand Central Spaceport and all the guides in it. Judas Priest, I think I have it. Crumbine shot up. It's a pilot advertisement. Boy next door, or that kind of thing. Print it to look like handwriting, which would make all the difference. And the pilot copy got mailed by accident, which would mean there is no real Richard Rowe. At that instant the door dilated, and two blue detective engines hustled a struggling young man into the office. He was slim, rather handsome, had a bushy head of hair that had somehow survived evolution and radioactive fallout, and across the chest and back of his paper singlet was neatly stamped Richard Rowe. When he saw the two men he stopped struggling and straightened up. "'Excuse me, gentlemen,' he said. But these police machines must have made a mistake. I've committed no crime. Then his gaze fell on the hand-addressed envelope on Crumbine's desk, and he turned pale. Crumbine laughed harshly. <laughs> no crime. No, not at all. Merely using the mails to communicate? Ha! The young man shrank back. I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, he says. Do you realize that your insane prank has resulted in the destruction of perhaps a half billion pieces of first-class advertising, in the strangulation of a postal station, and in the paralysis of Lower Manhattan, in the mobilization of SBI reserves, the deep mothballing of two divisions of GI machines, and the redeployment of the solar battle fleet? Good Lord, boy, why did you do it? Richard Rowe continued to shrink, but he squared his shoulders. I'm sorry, sir, but I just had to. I just had to get in touch with Jane Doe. A girl from another hive? A girl you'd merely gazed at because a guide happened to blow a fuse? Crumbine stood up, shaking his angry finger. Great Scott, boy! Where was your girl next door? Richard Rowe stared bravely at the finger, which made him look a trifle cross-eyed. She died, sir, both of them. But there should be at least six. I know, sir, but of the other four, two have been shipped to the Adirondacks on vacation, and two recently got married and haven't been replaced. Pot Shelter, a faraway look in his eyes, said softly, I think I'm beginning to understand. But Crumbine thundered on at Richard Rowe with, Good Lord, 
I can see you've had your troubles, boy. It isn't often we have these shortages of girls next door, so that temporarily a boy can't marry the girl next door, as he always should. But, Judas Priest, why didn't you take your troubles to your psychiatrist, your group master, your socializer, your queen mother? My psychiatrist is being overhauled, sir, and his replacement short circuits every time he hears the word trouble. My group master and socializer are on vacation duty in the Adirondacks. My queen mother is busy replacing girls next door. Yes, it all fits, Potshelter proclaimed excitedly. Don't you see, Crumbine? Except for a set of mischances that would only occur once in a billion billion times, the letter would never have been conceived or sent. You may have something there, Crumbine concurred. But in any case, boy, why did you, uh, written this letter to this particular girl? What is there about Jane Doe that made you do it? Well, uh, you see, sir, she's... Just then, a door redilated, and a blue matron machine conducted a young woman into the office. She was slim, and she had a head of hair that would have graced a museum beauty, while across the back and, well, chest is an inadequate word, of her paper chemise, Jane Doe was silk-screened in the palest pink. Crumbine did not repeat his last question. He had to admit to himself that it had been answered fully. Potshelter whistled respectfully. The blue detective machines gave hard-boiled grunts. Even the blue matron machine seemed awed by the girl's beauty. But she had eyes only for Richard Rowe. "'My grand central man,' she breathed in amazement. "'The man I've dreamed of ever since. "'My man with hair.' She noticed the way he was looking at her, and she breathed harder. "'Oh, darling, what have you done?' "'I tried to send you a letter.' "'A letter? For me? Oh, darling!' Crumbine cleared his throat. Potshelter, I'm going to wind this up fast. Miss Doe, could you transfer to this young man's hive? Oh, yes, sir. Mine has an overplus of girls next door. Good. Mr. Rowe, there's a sky pilot two levels up. Look for the usual white collar just below the photo cells. Marry this girl and take her home to your hive. If your queen mother objects, refer her to, uh, Potshelter here. He cut short the young people's thanks. "'Just one thing,' he said, wagging a finger at Roe. "'Don't written any more letters.' "'Why ever would I?' Richard answered. "'Already my action is beginning to seem like a mad dream.' "'Not to me, dear,' Jane corrected him. "'Oh, sir, could I have the letter he sent me? "'Not to do anything with, not to show anyone, just to keep.' "'Well, I don't know,' Crumbine began. "'Oh, please, sir.' "'Well, I don't know why not,' I was going to say. "'Here you are, miss. "'Just see that this husband of yours never writtens another.' He turned back as the contracting door shut the young couple from view. "'You were right, Potshelter,' he said briskly. It was one of those combinations of mischances that come up only once in a billion billion times. But we're going to have to issue recommendations for new procedures and safeguards that will reduce the possibilities to one in a trillion trillion. It will undoubtedly up the Terran income tax a healthy percentage, but we can't have something like this happen again. Every boy must marry the girl next door. And the first-class males must not be interfered with. The advertising must go through. I'd almost like to see it happen again, Potshelter murmured dreamily, if there were another Jane Doe in it. Outside, Richard and Jane had halted to allow a small cortege of machines to pass. First came a squad of police machines with black sorter in their midst, unmuzzled and docile enough, though still gnashing his teeth softly. Then, stretched out horizontally and borne on the shoulders of gray psychiatrist, 
Black Coroner, White Nursemaid Seven, and Greasy Joe, there passed the slim form of Pink Wastebasket, snow white in death. The machines were keening softly, mournfully. Round about the black pillars, little mecho mops were scurrying like mice, cleaning up the last of the first-class mail bits of confetti. Richard winced at this evidence of his aberration, but Jane squeezed his hand comfortingly, which produced in him a truly amazing sensation that changed his whole appearance. "'I know how you feel, darling,' she told him. "'But don't worry about it. Just think, dear. I'll always be able to tell your friends' wives something no other woman in the world can boast of, that my husband once wrote me a letter. End of The Last Letter by Fritz Leiber The Big Engine by Fritz Leiber This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Big Engine there are all sorts of screwy theories, the professor said, of what makes the wheels of the world go round. There's a boy in Chicago who thinks we're all of us just the thoughts of a green cat. When the green cat dies, we'll all puff to nothing like smoke. There's a man in the West who thinks all women are witches and run the world by conjure magic. There's a man of the East who believes all rich people belong to a secret society that's a lot tighter and tougher than the Mafia, and that has a monopoly of power secrets and pleasure secrets other people don't dream exist. Me? I think the wheels of the world just go. I decided that forty years ago, and I've never since seen or heard or read anything to make me change my mind. I was a stoker on a lake boat then, the professor continued, delicately sipping smoke from his long, thin cigarette. I was as stupid as they make them, but I liked to think, but I liked to think. Whenever I'd get a chance, I'd go to one of the big libraries and make them get me all sorts of books. That was how guys started calling me the professor. I'd get books on philosophy, metaphysics, science, even religion. I'd read them and try to figure out the world. What was it all about, anyway? Why was I here? What was the point in the whole business of getting born and working and dying? What was the use of it? Why did it have to go on and on? And why did it have to be so complicated? Why all the building and tearing down? Why did there have to be cities with crowded streets and horse cars and cable cars and electric cars and big open-work steel boxes to build in the sky to be hung with stone and wood? My closest friend got killed falling off one of those steel boxes. Shouldn't there be some simpler way of doing it all? Why did things have to be so mixed up that a man like myself couldn't have a single clear decent thought? More than that, why weren't people a real part of the world? Why didn't they show more honest-to-God response? When you slept with a woman, why was it something you had and she didn't? Why, when you went to a prize fight, were the bruisers only so much meat and the crowd a lot of little screaming popinjays? Why was war nothing but blather and blow up and bother? Why'd everybody have to go through their whole lives so dead? doing everything so methodical and prissy like a Sunday school picnic or an orphan's parade. And then, when I was reading one of the science books, it came to me. The answer was all there, printed out plain to see only nobody saw it. It was just this. Nobody was really alive. Back of other people's foreheads there weren't any real thoughts or minds or love or fear to explain things. The whole universe, stars and men and dirt and worms and atoms, the whole shooting match, was just one great big engine. It didn't take mind or life or anything else to run the engine. It just ran. Now, one thing about science... It doesn't lie. 
Those men who wrote those science books that showed me the answer, they had no more minds than anybody else. Just darkness in their brains. But because they were machines built to use science, they couldn't help but get the right answers. They were like the electric brains they've got now, but hadn't then, that gave out the right answer when you feed in the question. I'd like to feed in the question, what's life, to one of those machines, and see what came out. Just figures, I suppose. I read somewhere that if a billion monkeys had typewriters and kept pecking away at them, they'd eventually turn out all the Encyclopedia Britannica in trillions and trillions of years. Well, they've done it all right, and in jig time. They're doing it now. A lot of philosophy and psychology books I work through really fit in beautifully. There was Watson's behaviorism, telling how we needn't even assume that people are conscious to explain their actions. There was Leibniz's monadology, with its theory that we're all of us lonely atoms that are completely out of touch and don't affect each other in the slightest, but only seem to, because all our little clockwork motors were started at the same time in pre-established harmony. We seem to be responding to each other, but actually we're just a bunch of wooden-minded puppets. Jerk one puppet up into the flies, and the others go on acting as if exactly nothing at all had happened. So there it was, all laid out for me, the professor went on, carefully pinching out the end of his cigarette. That was why there was no honest-to-God response in people. They were machines. The fighters were machines made for fighting. The people that watched them were machines for stamping and screaming and swearing. The bankers had banking cogs in their bellies. The crooks had crooked cams. A woman was just a loving machine, all nicely adjusted to give you a good time, sometimes. But the farthest star was nearer to you than the mind behind that mouth you kissed. See what I mean? People just machines, set to do a certain job and then quietly rust away. If you kept on being the machine you were supposed to be, well and good, then your actions fitted with other people's. But if you didn't, if you started doing something else, then the others didn't respond. They just went on doing what was called for. It wouldn't matter what you did. They'd just go on making the motions they were set to make. They might be set to make love, and you might decide you wanted to fight. They'd go on making love while you fought them. Or it might happen the other way, seems too more often. Or somebody might be talking about Edison, and you'd happen to say something about Ingersoll, but he'd just go on talking about Edison. You were all alone. Except for a few others, not more than one in a hundred thousand, I guess, who wake up and figure things out. And they mostly go crazy and run themselves to death, or else turn mean. Mostly they turn mean. They get a cheap little kick out of pushing things around that can't push back. All over the world you find them. Little gangs of three or four, half a dozen, who've waked up but just to their cheap kicks. Maybe it's a couple of coppers in Frisco, a school teacher in K.C., some artists in New York, some rich kids in Florida, some undertakers in London, who found that all the people walking around are just dead folk and to be treated no decenter, who see how bad things are and get their fun out of making it a little worse. Just a mean little bit worse. They don't dare to destroy in a big way, because they know the machine feeds them and tends them, and because they're always scared they'd be noticed by gangs like themselves and wiped out. They haven't the guts to really wreck the whole shebang, but they get a kick out of scribbling their dirty pictures on it, out of meddling and messing with it. I've seen some of their fun, as they call it, sometimes hidden away, sometimes in the open streets. You've seen a clerk dressing a figure in a store window? Well, suppose he slapped its face. Suppose a kid stuck pins in a calico pussycat or threw pepper in the eyes of a doll. 
No decent live man would have anything to do with nickel sadism or dime paranoia like that. He'd either go back to his place in the machine and act out the part set for him, or else he'd hide away like me and live as quiet as he could, not stirring things up. Like a mouse in a dynamo or an ant in an atomics plant. The professor went to the window and opened it, letting the sour old smoke out and the noises of the city in. Listen, he said, listen to the great mechanical symphony, the great black combo. The airplanes are the double bass. Have you noticed how you can always hear one nowadays? When one walks out of the sky, another walks in. Presses and pumps round out the bass section. Listen to them rumble and thump. Tonight they've got an old steam locomotive helping. Maybe they're giving a benefit show for the old duffer. Cars and traffic, they're the strings, mostly cellos and violas. They purr and wail and whine and keep trying to get out of their section. Brasses, to me the steel on steel of streetcars and L trains always sounds like trumpets and cornets, strident, metallic, fiery, cold. Hear that siren way off? It's the clarinet. The ship horns are tubas, the diesel horns an oboe, and that lovely, dreadful French horn is an electric saw cutting down the last tree. But what a percussion section they've got! The big stuff, like streetcar bells jangling, is easy to catch. But you'll have to really listen to get the subtleties. The buzz of a defective neon sign, the click of a stoplight changing. Sometimes you do get human voices, I'll admit but they're not like they are in Beethoven's Ninth or Host's Planets. There's the real sound of the universe, the professor concluded, shutting the window. That's your heavenly choir. That's the music of the spheres the old alchemists kept listening for. If they just stayed around a little longer, they'd have all been deafened by it. Oh, to think that Schopenhauer was bothered by the crack of Carter's whips. And now it's time for this mouse to tuck himself in his nest in the dynamo. Good night, gentlemen. End of The Big Engine by Fritz Leiber Creativity for Cats by Fritz Leiber This recording is in the public domain. Creativity for Cats by Fritz Leiber Gummitch peered thoughtfully at the molden silver image of the sun in his little bowl of water on the floor inside the kitchen window. He knew from experience that it would make dark ghost suns swim in front of his eyes for a few moments, and that was mildly interesting. Then he slowly thrust his head out over the water, careful not to ruffle its surface by rough breathing, and stared down at the mirror cat, the Gummitch double staring up at him. Gummitch had early discovered that water mirrors are very different from most glass mirrors. The scentless spirit world behind glass mirrors is an upright one sharing our gravity system, its floor a continuation of the floor in the so-called real world. But the world in a water mirror has reverse gravity. One looks down into it, but the spirit doubles in it look up at one. In a way, water mirrors are holes or pits in the world, leading down to a spirit infinity or ghostly nadir. Gummitch had pondered as to whether, if he plunged into such a pit, he would be sustained by the spirit gravity or fall forever. It may well be that speculations of this sort account for the caution about swimming characteristic of most cats. There was at least one exception to the general rule. The looking-glass on Kitty Come Here's dressing table also opened into a spirit world of reverse gravity, as Gummitch had discovered when he happened to look into it during one of the regular visits he made to the dressing table top to enjoy the delightful flowery and musky odors emanating from the fragile bottles assembled there. 
But exceptions to general rules, as Gummich knew well, are only doorways to further knowledge and finer classifications. The wind could not get into the spirit world below Kitty Come Here's looking glass, while one of the definitive characteristics of water mirrors is that movement can very easily enter the spirit world below them, rhythmically disturbing it throughout, producing the most surreal effects, and even reducing it to chaos. Such disturbances exist only in the spirit world, and are in no way a mirroring of anything in the real world. Gummitch knew that his paw did not change when it flicked the surface of the water, although the image of his paw burst into a hundred flickering fragments. Both cats and primitive men first deduced that the world in a water mirror is a spirit world, because they saw that its inhabitants were easily blown apart by the wind, and must therefore be highly tenuous, though capable of regeneration. Gummitch mildly enjoyed creating rhythmic disturbances in the spirit worlds below water mirrors. He wished there was some way to bring their excitement and weird beauty into the real world. On this sunny day, when our story begins, the spirit world below the water mirror in his drinking bowl was particularly vivid and bright. Gummitch stared for a while longer at the Gummitch double, and then thrust down his tongue to quench his thirst. Curling swiftly upward, it conveyed a splash of water into his mouth, and also flicked a single drop of water into the air before his nose. The sun struck the drop, and it flashed like a diamond. In fact, it seemed to Gummitch that for a moment he had juggled the sun on his tongue. He shook his head amazedly and touched the side of the bowl with his paw. The bowl was brimful, and a few drops fell out. They also flashed like tiny suns as they fell. Gummitch had a fleeting vision, a momentary creative impulse, that was gone from his mind before he could seize it. He shook his head once more, backed away from the bowl, and then lay down with his head pillowed on his paws to contemplate the matter. The room darkened as the sun went under a cloud, and the young, golden, dark-barred cat looked like a pool of sunlight left behind. Kitty Come Here had watched the whole performance from the door to the dining room, and that evening she commented on it to old horsemeat. "'He backed away from the water as if it were poison,' she said. "'They must have been putting more chlorine in it lately, you know, and maybe he can taste the fluorides they put in for dental decay.' Old Horsemeat doubted that, but his wife went on. I can't figure out where Gummitch does his drinking these days. There never seems to be any water gone from his bowl, and we haven't had any cut flowers, and none of the faucets strip. He probably does his drinking somewhere outside, Old Horsemeat guessed. But he doesn't go outside very often these days, Kitty come here countered. Scarface and the mad eunuch, you know. Besides, it hasn't rained for weeks. It's certainly a mystery to me where he gets his liquids. Boiling gets the chlorine out of the water, doesn't it? I think I'll try him on some tomorrow. Maybe he's depressed, Old Horsemeat suggested. That often leads to secret drinking. This Baroque witticism hit fairly close to the truth. Gummitch was depressed had been depressed ever since he had lost his kittenish dreams of turning into a man, achieving spaceflight, learning and publishing all the secrets of the fourth dimension and similar marvels. The black cloud of disillusionment at realizing he could only be a cat had lightened somewhat, but he was still feeling dull and unfulfilled. Gummitch was at that difficult age for he-cats, between first puberty, when the cat achieves essential maleness, and second puberty, when he gets broad-chested, jowly, and thick-ruffed, becoming a fully-armed sexual competitor. In the ordinary course of things, he would have been spending much of his time exploring the outer world, detail-mapping the immediate vicinity, spying on other cats, making cautious approaches to unescorted females, 
and in all ways comporting himself like a fledgling male. But this was prevented by the two burly Toms who lived in the houses next door, and who, far more interested in murder than the pursuit of mates, had entered into partnership with the sole object of bushwhacking Gummitch. Gummitch's household had nicknamed them Scarface and the Mad Eunuch, the latter being one of those males whom fixing turns not placid, but homicidally maniacal. Compared to these seasoned heavyweights, Gummitch was a welterweight at most. Scarface and the Mad Eunuch lay in wait for him by turns, just beyond the kitchen door, so that his forays into the outside world were largely reduced to dashes for some hiding-hole, followed by long, boring, but perilous sieges. He often wished that old horse meets two older cats, Asher Banipal and Cleopatra, had not gone to the country to live with old horse meets mother. They would have shown the evil bushwhackers a thing or two. Because of Scarface and the mad eunuch, Gummitch spent most of his time indoors. Since a cat is made for half-and-half half existence, half in the wild forest, half in the secure cave, he took to brooding quite morbidly. He thought over much of ghost cats in the mirror world, and of the skeleton cat who starved to death in a locked closet, and similar grisly legends. He immersed himself in racial memories, not so much of ancient Egypt, where cats were prized as minions of the lovely cat goddess past, and ceremoniously mummified at the end of tranquil lives, as of the Middle Ages, when European mankind waged a genocidal war against felines, as being the familiars of witches. He thought briefly of turning Kitty Come Here into a witch, but his hypnotic staring and tentative ritualistic mewing only made her fidgety and he devoted more and more time to devising dark versions of the theory of transmigration, picturing cats as silent souls, gagged people of great talent, and the like. He had become too self-conscious to re-enter often the make-believe world of the kitten, yet his imagination remained as active as ever. It was a truly frustrating predicament. More and more often, and for longer periods, he retired to meditate in a corrugated cardboard shoebox, open only at one end. The cramped quarters made it easier for him to think. Old Horsemeat called it the Cat Orgon Box, after the famed Orgon energy accumulators of the late wildcat psychoanalyst Dr. Wilhelm Reich. If only, Gummitch thought, he could devise some way of objectifying the imitations of beauty that flitted through his darkly clouded mind— now, on the evening of the sunny day, when he had backed away from his water-bowl, he attacked the problem anew. He knew he had been fleetingly on the verge of a great idea, an idea involving water, light, and movement, an idea he had unfortunately forgotten. He closed his eyes and twitched his nose. "'I must concentrate,' he thought to himself. "'Concentrate!' Next day, Kitty Come Here remembered her idea about Gummitch's water. She boiled two cupfuls in a spotless enamelware saucepan, letting it cool for half an hour before using it to replace the seemingly offensive water in the young cat's bowl. It was only then she noticed that the bowl had been upset. She casually assumed that big-footed old horsemeat must have been responsible for the accident— or possibly one of the two children, darting sissy or blundering baby. She wiped the bowl and filled it with the water she had dechlorinated. "'Come here, Kitty, come here,' she called to Gummitch, who had been watching her actions attentively from the dining-room door. The young cat stayed where he was. "'Oh, well, if you want to be coy,' she said, shrugging her shoulders. There was a mystery about the spilled water— it had apparently disappeared entirely, though the day seemed hardly dry enough for total evaporation. Then she saw it standing in a puddle by the wall, fully ten feet away from the bowl. She made a quick deduction and frowned a bit worriedly. "'I never realized the kitchen floor sloped that much,' she told old horse meat after dinner. 
Maybe some beams need to be jacked up in the basement. I'd hate to think of collapsing into it while I cook dinner. I'm sure this house finished all its settling thirty years ago, her husband assured her hurriedly. That slope's always been there. Well, if you say so, Kitty come here aloud doubtfully. Next day she found Gummitch's bowl upset again, and the remains of the boiled water in a puddle across the room. As she mopped it up, she began to do some thinking without benefit of concentration box. That evening, after Old Horsemeat and Sissy had vehemently denied kicking into the water bowl or stepping on its edge, she voiced her conclusions. "'I think Gummitch upsets it,' she said. "'He's rejecting it. It still doesn't taste right to him, and he wants to show us.' Maybe he only likes it after it runs across the floor and got seasoned with household dust and the corpses of germs, suggested old horsemeat, who believed most cats were bohemian types. I'll have you know I scrub that linoleum, Kitty come here asserted. Well, with detergent and scouring powder, then, old horsemeat amended resourcefully. Kitty come here made a scornful noise. I still want to know where he gets his liquids, she said. He's been off milk for weeks, you know, and he only drinks a little broth when I give him that. Yet he doesn't seem dehydrated. It's a real mystery, and maybe he's built a still in the attic, old horsemeat interjected, and I'm going to find the answers, Kitty come here concluded, ignoring the facetious interruption. I'm going to find out where he gets the water he does drink, and why he rejects the water I give him. This time I'm going to boil it and put in a pinch of salt, just a pinch. You make animals sound more delicate about food and drink than humans, old horsemeat observed. They probably are, his wife countered. For one thing, they don't smoke or drink martinis. It's my firm belief that animals, cats anyway, like good food just as much as we do, and the same sort of good food. They don't enjoy canned cat food any more than we would, though they can eat it, just as we could if we had to. I really don't think Gummidge would have such a passion for raw horse meat, except you started him on it so early. He probably thinks of it as steak tartare, old horse meat said. Next day, Kitty come here found her salted offering upset just as the two previous bowls had been. Such were the beginnings of the great spilled water mystery that preoccupied the human members of the Gummidge household for weeks. Not every day, but frequently, and sometimes two and three times a day, Gummidge's little bowl was upset. No one ever saw the young cat do it but it was generally accepted that he was responsible, though for a time old horsemeat had theories that he did not voice involving Sissy and Baby. Kitty come here bought Gummitch a firm-footed rubber bowl for his water, though she hesitated over the purchase for some time, certain he would be able to taste the rubber. The bowl was found upset just like his regular china one, and like the tin one she briefly revived from his kitten days. All sorts of clues and possibly related circumstances were seized upon and dissected. For instance, after about a month of the mysterious spillings, Kitty come here announced, I've been thinking back, and as far as I can remember it never happens except on sunny days. Oh, good Lord, old horsemeat reacted. Meanwhile, Kitty come here continued to try to concoct a kind of water that would be palatable to Gummidge. As she continued without success, her formulas became more fantastic. She quit boiling it for the most part, but added a pinch of sugar, a spoonful of beer, a few flakes of oregano, a green leaf, a violet, a drop of vanilla extract, a drop of iodine. No wonder he rejects the stuff, old horsemeat was tempted to say, but didn't. Finally, Kitty come here, inspired by the sight of a greenishly glittering rack of it at the supermarket, purchased a half-gallon of bottled water from a famous spring. 
She wondered why she hadn't thought of this step earlier. It certainly ought to take care of her haunting convictions about the unpalatableness of chlorine or fluorides. She herself could distinctly taste the fluorides in the tap water, though she never mentioned this to old horsemeat. One other development during the great spilled water mystery was that Gummidge gradually emerged from depression and became quite gay. He took to dancing cat scottiches and geegs impromptu in the living room of an evening, and so forgot his dignity as to battle joyously with the vacuum cleaner dragon when old horsemeat used one of these smaller attachments to curry him. The young cat clutched the hairy round brush to his stomach and madly clawed as it woofled menacingly. Even the afternoon he came home with a shoulder gashed by the mad eunuch, he seemed strangely light-hearted and debonair. The mystery was abruptly solved one sunny Sunday afternoon. Going into the bathroom in her stocking feet, Kitty come here saw Gummidge apparently trying to drown himself in the toilet. His hindquarters were on the seat, but the rest of his body went down into the bowl. Coming closer, she saw that his forelegs were braced against the opposite side of the bowl, just above the water surface, while his head thrust down sharply between his shoulders. She could distinctly hear rhythmic lapping. To tell the truth, Kitty come here was rather shocked. She had certain rather fixed ideas about the delicacy of cats. It speaks well for her progressive grounding that she did not shout at Gummidge, but softly summoned her husband. By the time old Horsemeat arrived, the young cat had refreshed himself and was coming out of his well with a sudden backward undulation. He passed them in the doorway with a single mew and upward look, and then made off for the kitchen. The blue and white room was bright with sunlight. Outside the sky was blue and the leaves were rustling in a stiff breeze. Gummidge looked back once, as if to make sure his human cogeners had followed, mewed again, and then advanced briskly toward his little bowl, with the air of one who proposes to reveal all mysteries at once. Kitty come here had almost outdone herself. She had, for the first time, poured him the bottled water, and she had floated a few rose petals on the surface. Gummidge regarded them carefully, sniffed at them, and then proceeded to fish them out one by one and shake them off his paw. Old Horsemeat repressed the urge to say, I told you so. When the water surface was completely free and winking in the sunlight, Gummidge curved one paw under the side of the bowl and jerked. Half the water spilled out, gathered itself, and then began to flow across the floor in little rushes, a silver ribbon sparkling with sunlight that divided and subdivided and reunited as it followed the slope. Gummidge crouched to one side, watching it intensely, following its progress inch by inch and foot by foot, almost pouncing on the little temporary pools that formed, but not quite touching them. Twice he mewed faintly in excitement. "'He's playing with it,' old Horsemeat said incredulously. "'No,' Kitty come here, countered wide-eyed. "'He's creating something. "'Silver mice, water snakes, twinkling vines.' "'Good Lord, you're right,' old Horsemeat agreed. "'It's a new art form.' Would you call it water painting or water sculpture? Somehow I think that's best. As if a sculpture made mobiles out of molten tin. It's gone so quickly, though, Kitty come here objected a little sadly. Art ought to last. Look, it's almost all flowed over to the wall now. Some of the best art forms are completely fugitive, old Horsemeat argued. What about improvisation and music and dancing? What about jam sessions and shadow figures on the wall? Gummidge can always do it again. In fact, he must have been doing it again and again this last month. It's never exactly the same, like waves or fires. But it's beautiful. I suppose so, Kitty come here said. 
Then, coming to herself, she continued, "'But I don't think it can be healthy for him to go on drinking water out of the toilet, really.' Old Horsemeat shrugged. He had an insight about the artistic temperament and the need to dig for inspiration into the smelly fundamentals of life, but it was difficult to express delicately. Kitty come here, sighed, as if bidding farewell to all her efforts with rose petals and crystalline bottle purity and vanilla extract and the soda water which had amazed Gummitch by faintly spitting and purring at him. "'Oh, well,' she said, "'I can scrub it out more often, I suppose.' Meanwhile, Gummitch had gone back to his bowl, and, using both paws, overset it completely. Now, nose a-twitch, he once more pursued the silver streams alive with suns, refreshing his spirit with the sight of them. He was fretted by no problems about what he was doing. He had solved them all with one of his characteristically sharp distinctions. There was sacred water, the sparkling clear water to create with, and there was the water with character, the water to drink. End of Creativity for Cats by Fritz Leiber